that song is so appropriate uh, and so true. Thy word is a lamp to my feet. This morning, uh, we are going to be at Romans chapter 12 once again, verses 1 and 2. If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to page 803, that's the text we're going to be looking at this morning. I had planned on kind of moving ahead uh, in that text, but, but there's just some more stuff there that I want us to, to deal with a little bit this morning. Uh, for those of you that have been following my updates on Facebook and emails about Dory, you, you've heard this, but for those of you that haven't, uh, this week I went up to see Dory one afternoon, and when I got there they had taken her outside on the patio to, to walk around, and she sat down and and I don't know how it came up, but she said she looked kind of at me and she said, you've gained weight. <laughs> and I said, well, sweetie, I, I know. I said, I probably have because I just, all I do is sit around and worry about you and everybody comes up and takes me out to eat or brings me food. So yeah, I probably have lost some weight. I said, but you get better and we'll start running again and I'll lose it. And she said, you should probably start before then. <laughs> And like I said on my update, I said, and imagine just not too few week a few weeks ago, I was you know praying that should be speaking again. <laughs> be careful what you ask for. But you know the reality is, uh, I, I have I, I have put on some weight in the last few. I don't even dare step on a scale. But you know most of you know that that I did some running this year. In fact, Dory and I ran two half marathons, so now I can officially say I have run a marathon. <laughs> it took me two times to do it, and we ran a 5K. And you know, running has never been a, a big deal for me. In fact, I hated running; could not stand the thought of running. Tried to run in high school, wasn't any good at it. Uh, the only reason I got into it was summer before last, Tasha talked Dory into running or into participating in a sprint triathlon. And so while Dory was training for that, I thought, well, you know, I'll be a good husband and I'll go run with her. And so I started running. Well, that run in the sprint triathlon was only three miles. And uh, I thought, you know, I, I could probably tough out three miles. But, you know, I've got this bum knee, right? And I really do. I've had two surgeries on it. And that had always been my excuse why I couldn't run because my, my knee, you know, got this bad knee. And I would run, and when I got up about two miles, it, it would start to kind of bind up on me. And so I'd have to stop and walk it out. But then while we're training for that sprint triathlon, Tasha talks Dory into running a half marathon, which is 13.1 miles. And so instead of just running to get ready for a three-mile run, now we have to start running longer distances. And we're talking like four miles. I've never run four miles in my life. I mean, it's a hassle enough for me to drive four miles, much less run four miles, and then five miles. And I'm thinking to myself, I've got a good out. My knee won't last. Well, one day we're running, and we had to run five miles, and and I thought, well, I'll run my three, and then I can walk the last two home. And, and I got up to three miles, and the knee was starting to bind up, and I was really glad. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the pain went away. And I could keep running. Now, I've lost my excuse without lying, and I didn't want to do that, so I just kept running. And what I found was, the more I ran, the better I felt. And when we started getting up to longer and longer distances, you know, I just, I really started feeling good. I started eating better, and before long, I just, I felt healthy. And then we ran that first half marathon, and then we started training for the second one, and I went down, I got my cholesterol checked, and it was normal for the first time in my entire life. You know, and they've had me on medications forever, and, and I've always just been hovering just above the normal mark. And he's always talking about, you know, increasing it just a little bit. And, and I keep saying, let me see if I can get it down. Well, I finally did, but it takes running. And, and so we trained for the second half marathon, and, and I felt good. Well, I finished that race, and I felt really good. Then we ran a 5K, and I felt really good. And then I haven't done anything for the last two months, and I feel good. You know? You don't realize how good things are until you experience them. 
you know, people had always told me, people who run always said, you feel great when you're running. And I was like, yeah, right. Until I started running. And now I know what they mean. And now especially that, I, that I've gotten out of shape, you know, I, I feel the difference. You know, and I want us to think this morning about how awesome it would be to truly experience the life God has in store for us here. And, and I'm going to say, I'm going to step out and say, I'm willing to bet most of us have never truly experienced it in all of its grandeur. I think that's kind of what Paul is talking about when he writes this church, or this letter to the church in Rome. You know, we, we saw last week how he's kind of getting on to the two groups about, you know, thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to, and he kind of humbles them back down. And, and in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, Paul lays out, a couple of truths about living this changed life. And this morning I want to challenge all of us and, and tell us we need, we must be changing the way our life is. Number one, because if, if we're not, we're not going to be we're not going to be pleasing God. But number two, we're not really going to experience the, the wondrous life that God has planned for us. And so I want us to look at these two truths that, that Paul lays out for the church here. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It begins by saying, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And I want to begin by saying there is a physical response to God's mercy. The body, the body is to be offered as a sacrifice to God. Now, we need to understand, first of all, the reason for this sacrifice is God's mercy, in view of God's mercy. And he says, therefore, based on everything that Paul has explained uh, prior to this, and what Paul has done is he's laid out this argument that says, the only way you are saved is by God's mercy. If you are a Jew, you're not saved because you've kept the law. If you're a Gentile, you're not saved uh, because of anything you've done. In fact, God has grafted you in a wild olive shoot. He's grafted you into the life-giving root. But everything is what God has done. And so the, the argument that Paul has, has, has laid out is that only by God's mercy are we saved. Now, he goes on, and I'm going to take, that's at the beginning, and then at the end he says, this is your spiritual act of worship. And we'll talk about what's in the middle in a moment. The word translated spiritual there in the NIV is a word that, that is closely related to our word logical. In fact, it's closely related to the Greek word logical. It, it has to do with, uh, in fact, some translations translate it reasonable. It's not just that it's a spiritual act of worship that's something that's done only with the Spirit. It's a, it's a physical, bodily thing, but it's reasonable. What Paul is saying is the only reasonable response to God based upon His mercy and the fact that He saved you, the only reasonable thing then is to offer your bodies back to Him. It is your reasonable act of worship. And he calls it an act of worship or an act of service, this is something you do back to God, back for God. It's not, we tend to think sometimes of worship is only what goes on right here for this one hour. But what Paul is talking about in offering the body as a sacrifice is he's talking about something that's done in the daily life. And, and I want to look at that sacrifice of the body right now. The NIV translates it to offer your body as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God. Unfortunately that's not exactly the way that the Greek uh, words it there. It, it's not living sacrifices. What it says literally is to offer your bodies as a sacrifice living holy and pleasing to God. And, and I think there's a distinction there, and I think that, that what Paul is saying to the, to the people there is that they are to live with their body in a way that's holy. 
They are to control their body and make their body do things that is set apart from the rest of the world. They're to make their body be in such a way that it's pleasing to God. They're to have control over their body. Now, some, some scholars will say that the body is just a... Uh, expression of the totality of the person, and I think that is true, but I think also what Paul is saying is you've got to keep your body in check. What you do with your body is a worship to God. Because sometimes we will do things with our body that we know we ought not to, but with our minds we're, we're trying to justify and rationalize it, but what Paul is saying is your body needs to be controlled in such a way that it's set apart, distinct from everything else in the world around you, and it's pleasing to God. And so we need to rethink how we worship God in our daily lives. We need to give a little more thought to God's mercy. We need to understand and dwell on the idea that no matter how long we've been members of the church, no matter how long our family history goes back in the church, no matter what we've done in the church or for the church, there's nothing that you and I could have ever done to save ourselves. The only way we will ever get to heaven is because of God's mercy. And that ought to impact and change the way we live our daily lives. Our, act, our sacrifice should become a way of life. It's, it's easy for us to become Sunday Christians. Well, there's so much temptation out there in the world, so much temptation to satisfy the cravings of our sinful nature, the, the cravings of our body. And it's so easy to go out there every day and, and we live that life. We do what feels good to me and what pleases me. And then we come in on Sunday and we, and we dedicate this hour to God. But what Paul says is that our lives every day, day in and day out, are to be set apart for God. Are to be controlled in a way that pleases God. And really that's the only reasonable response to the mercy that God has shown us. Is it a spiritual thing? Yes, it is because, because the Spirit of God now lives in us and guides and directs us how we are going to live and how we are going to control our, our body. And we ought to be worshiping God in every moment of every day with our body. I want to ask you a question. I don't want you to raise hands because even though it would be easy to raise hands on the first question, the second question you might not want to, to, to reveal to everyone, but I want you to think honestly and deeply about these two questions. First of all, uh, how many of you consider yourselves to be a Christian? I said don't raise your hands. No, you're not following instructions. <laughs> But if you raised your hands on that one, then I guess you'll have to raise your hands on this one. How many of you would consider yourselves to be, or would consider your bodies as holy to God? There was a, a survey done by the Barna Group in 2006, and, and I'm reading here, it says it demonstrated that most Americans don't consider themselves to be holy. Three out of every four Americans, now this is the American population in general, this is not the church, we'll get to that in a minute, but three out of every four Americans, or 73%, believe that it's possible for someone to become holy regardless of their past, but only half of the adult population, 50%, however, said that they knew someone that they considered to be holy. Now again, holy does not mean perfect, it means set apart to God. 73% of Americans said that yes, people can become holy regardless of what they've done in their past, but only half of Americans said they knew someone that they considered to be holy or set apart to God. And only 21% of those considered themselves to be holy and set apart to God. And you think 21%? That's not many people. 
and consider themselves to be holy, but, but surely in the church that's a whole lot better. Well, the statistics in the church were almost exactly the same. 76% of all believers, born-again Christians, said that it's possible for a person to become holy regardless of their past. A little more than half, 55%, said they knew someone that they would describe as holy. And only 29% of Christians said that their lives were holy. And, and I read this and I think maybe this is part of the reason that, that churches these days are struggling with growing and bringing people in. Because we don't even consider ourselves different from the rest of the world. We don't look at ourselves as being holy and set apart. That's probably because we haven't set our bodies apart. And we haven't set our minds apart. We, we probably have never jumped in and started training to run the race that God has called us to do because uh, Blake and I were talking before uh, services began this morning, you know, water flows to the path of least resistance, and I think we do too. We do what's easiest. Living a holy life is not the easiest. But that's what we're called to do. So how do we go about changing our life? How do we go about making our bodies this sacrifice that is living, holy, and pleasing to God? And I think that's what Paul comes into next. He gives kind of two instructions for holy living in verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, offering the body as a sacrifice has to do with what influences a person. The, the first part of this, this is a negative command, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Uh, NIV misses the translation a little bit because this is a passive verb. And they translated it almost as an active verb. Uh, what it really literally should say is do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Uh, you know, active means like, you know, I hit Randy. That would be me being active. Passive would mean that Randy hit me. And I received the hit. And Paul is saying do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Don't let this world shove you into its pattern. Don't be so influenced by this world that, or this age. Literally, the word there is this age. Uh, the, the world is it's controlled by Satan who is ruling now. Don't let this world just squeeze you into its pattern. And then he goes on with the, with the next step. And, and, and by the way, you know, the church in Rome, the world in Rome had a really powerful influence on these early Christians trying to get them to, to act and to think and to be just like the rest of the world. So Paul turns around and tells them to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Again, this is a passive verb. It's something that's influencing these people uh, to change them. It's not something that, that they do, but it's something that's done to them. Paul is telling them to be transformed. Now some say that, well... What Paul is saying is there's, they're conformed and then there's transformed. Conform means to just act a certain way. Transform means to be changed. But I think Paul is saying don't be conformed to that world because that will actually transform you. But instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, the transformation is brought about by what goes in up here. And so they needed to change the way they thought, because the way they thought would affect the way they act. They needed to change their thinking from living in this present age to living in the kingdom of God. They needed uh, the kingdom of God uh, taught to them and shown to them in a way of life and morals and ethics and values that was drilled into them, into their minds to the point that it changed how they acted outwardly. And then Paul goes on to tell them that, that once this transformation takes place, it's going to bring about a greater wisdom. And again, there's a, a question of how the translation is made here. NIV translates it by saying, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. 
And, and, I, and that's a, a good translation, but I think the emphasis here has more to do along the lines of this. Then you'll be able to test what God's will is. And you will know that God's will in your life is good and pleasing and perfect. Paul is telling the church there in Rome, you're looking for what's good in the world around you. And you're never going to find it. Because the world is not good. It's ruled by Satan. It'll never be good. You're looking in the world for things that are pleasing to you, and you're never going to find them. Because the things in this world are temporary, and then the pleasure is gone. And a lot of times things that bring pleasure at one point turn around and bring pain and hardship later on. You'll never find pleasure in this world. You're looking for something that's perfect in this world, and you're never going to find it. You're looking for the perfect spouse, the perfect job, the perfect whatever, and you're never going to find it. The only way to know good and pleasing and perfect life is to be transformed so that you know the will of God. Because God's will for your life is good. God's will for your life is pleasing. God's will for your life is perfect. But only when you live that can you fully experience it and know how awesome it is. And church, that lesson that I think Paul is, is saying to them is so true for us today. We must not, never allow the world to force us into its path. This means that we need to scrutinize everything from this world. We need to scrutinize what we watch. We need to scrutinize what we listen to, what we read. Everything about our lives, we need to, to, to ask ourselves, is this really in accordance with God's will? Or am I just letting myself be come just wherever the world takes me? We need to allow ourselves to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We need to put new messages into our head. We need to, to be transformed according to God's will, which means we need to, to listen to things that are in accordance with God's will. We need to read things in accordance with God's will. We need to watch things that are in accordance with God's will. We need to start transforming our minds. How many of you listen to K-Love, the, the radio station that's on now, that plays contemporary Christian music? They, had a, they started a deal the first of the year, 30 days of listening to nothing but Christian music. And that was their challenge. Now, I've listened to the radios. I'm driving back and forth to the hospital, back and forth to work. And I usually listen to K-Love anyway because it's positive encouraging. That's their slogan, positive encouraging K-Love. And, and it usually is pretty you know, positive encouraging, a whole lot more than Jim Fisher or Rush Limbaugh. And so I, I listen to that quite a bit. And they're doing this challenge for 30 days, and they put reports on there of people whose lives have been affected by listening to nothing but Christian music since then. Well, the other day I got in my pickup. I've been driving Dory's car, and I got in my pickup to, to haul some, some equipment out at the farm the other day, and I turned the radio on. Well, it was still set on uh, the country station. I'm driving along in the road, drink, singing about drinking whiskey barefoot on a beach, and all of a sudden it dawned on me how easy it is to just go, to go with the flow. So I hit number two on my radio dial and went to Kayla and listened to my Christian music because it changes our thinking. And, and I want to challenge you to start doing some things in your life that will change your thinking. Listen to Christian radio stations. Listen, read Christian books. Watch Christian movies. And start being transformed by that. Because when we allow this transformation, then we're going to see that the world really doesn't hold any good. And the world really doesn't provide any pleasure. And the world is not perfect. This world holds out a lot of promises, but they're all empty. Only God's will 
in our life can truly bring pleasure and good and perfection. Only God's will can really make us happy. A preacher named uh, Philip Ryken used this illustration. He posted it online, and so I'm borrowing it. And I'm just going to read it verbatim. He said, in his book, Don't Waste Your Life, John Piper recounts a story his father often told in his days as a fiery Baptist evangelist. It is a story of a man who came to saving faith in Jesus Christ near the end of his earthly existence. <clears throat> Piper writes, the church had prayed for this man for decades. He was hard and resistant, but this time, for some reason, he showed up when my father was preaching. And at the end of the service, during a, during a hymn, to everyone's amazement, the man came and took my father's hand. They sat down together on the front pew of the church as the people were dismissed. And God opened his heart to the gospel of Christ, and he was saved from his sins and given new life. But that did not stop him from sobbing and saying as the tears ran down his wrinkled face, I've wasted it. I've wasted it. By the grace of God, even a life that is almost totally wasted can still be redeemed. As the Scottish theologian Thomas Boston once said, our present existence is only a short preface to the long eternity. If that, man, if that is true, then the man's life was not wasted after all. He was only just beginning an eternal life of endless praise. And then Riken goes on and says, but why wait even a moment longer before you start to serve Jesus? You only have one life to live. Don't waste it by living for yourself when you can use it instead to the glory of God. And I want to add to that, don't waste any more time trying to find good and pleasing and perfect in this world because you won't. The only place you will ever find good, pleasing, and perfect life are when you submit to the will of God. And when you are transformed by the renewing of your mind and your life becomes centered upon Him because He was so merciful that He gave His life for you. And you live it back. And church, I want to challenge all of us to begin living this way. Because just like I started and kind of unconsciously started listening to nothing but Christian music, then when you get in the car and you realize that there's a beer drinking song on, it hits you. Kind of like when I was running, I felt good, but now I really I feel good. And when we live according to God's Word, we're gonna, it's going to be awesome, and we'll notice it when we stop. And that will call us back to it again. But we've got to start living for God. We've got to start being transformed by the renewing of our mind. We've got to give our life fully to Him. This morning, if you want to experience that full, perfect, good, pleasing life, then we invite you to come down here because this morning you can have all of your past sins washed away. You can be reborn, given new life to walk in holiness and give a life that's pleasing to God. And if that's your desire this morning, we invite you to come forward while we stand and sing this song.